The city of steel, Pittsburgh, home to the largest funicular in the United States. Now, hold up, you might be asking yourself, what is a funicular? Well, it's a cable car combined with a train and carriages attached to cables that pull them up a track at a high incline, allowing them to traverse high angles that a train normally wouldn't be able to. And yet, unbeknownst to most, Pittsburgh had 17 of them. Yet today, many have been abandoned and ravaged by time. Join us to find out why, as today we discover the story of Pittsburgh's funiculars. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Pittsburgh was one of the major hubs of industry in Pennsylvania after the Civil War. Rich in coal and iron, it was a steel production powerhouse in the late 19th century. Most of these minerals were in the steep hills and around the city, providing a lot of issues with transit. Not to mention, since Pittsburgh was a vital connection point for industry and transit, real estate was a constant concern. So if you wanted a good place to live, it needed to be near a job site that was easy to get to and pull resources from, and neither of those were happening. However, there was a solution to the latter issue, an incline plane, as they called it back in the 1800s. It was an easy way to get coal from the mines down into the city without risk. One of the first accounts we have of them dates back as far as 1864 to the Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon Plain. Opened in 1871, it offered a great way to transit coal from the hills in Mount Washington, then known simply as Coal Hill, down into the city. However, it didn't facilitate passengers yet, and there was no easy way up the Coal Hill, meaning the morning commute was dangerous, not to mention tedious and exhausting. If they could open an incline plane for people, it would not only make the job site attractive thanks to the easy access, but it would make all of those prospective employees consider the area around Coal Hill prime real estate. That was a single solution that solved two problems, creating a version of the Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon plane for the people. That idea culminated in the Monongahela Incline, the oldest funicular still operating in the United States, and possibly the oldest in the New World. We'll use the Monongahela Incline as a reference for the rest of the building of funiculars. The state of Pennsylvania approved an act to incorporate the Mount Washington Inclined Plane Company in February of 1854. This act approved the city power to construct one or more inclined planes to run cars from any point or points on the riverbank between the Magahela Bridge and the Jones Ferry to the brow of Coal Hill. This plane was delayed due to the American Civil War, but on April the 12th, 1867, the company was formed all the same, created to build a funicular from Carson Street to Magahela Borough and Coal Hill. The two head engineers of the funiculars were John J. Enders and Samuel Descher. Enders was born in Prussia, which eventually became Germany. He moved to the United States in 1866 and did some work in Cincinnati, Ohio, before taking the incline job in Pittsburgh. Descher was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1839. The son of a prominent Hungarian architect, he learned his craft in Germany and Switzerland before moving to Cincinnati in 1866, joining Enders for the construction of the Monongahela Incline. During this time, the company and state also cemented the purpose of the incline, and after construction, it officially became the first built for transporting people rather than materials. Two locations were suggested. One became the location for the Monongahela Incline, and the other became the location of the Duquesne Incline seven years later. These two are the only inclines still in operation today. By November of 1869, the engine house of the Monongahela Incline was nearing completion, and the boiler house was to begin soon after. A wooden trestle supported the Iron T rail tracks, and an iron bridge supported the incline over railroad tracks just above the lower station. By May the 28th, 1870, 
Opening day arrived, and the first passenger funicular in America functioned flawlessly, despite the difficulties others had in achieving its purpose. The Monongahela Incline's initial fare was six cents. The operator of the incline sat in a glass enclosure called the pulpit. He used hand throttle levers and a foot brake, controlling each of the cars ascending and descending the tracks. At the opening, the operator worked a single shift from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. However, when a new funicular was constructed in 1884 to transmit resources, the shift was reduced to 12 hours. The first man to take the role of operator was named George Naismith, and he saw 994 people up and down the incline. But on the next day, he watched 4,174 people do the same thing. The two stars of the Pittsburgh funiculars are the Monongahela Incline and the Duquesne Incline, which isn't that much of a surprise considering that they're the only ones still active. The former operated consistently for well over 100 years, and in 1974 was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Duquesne received that same honor in 1975. So firstly, let's talk a little bit more about the Monongahela. It's 635 feet in length, climbing 369 feet in height at a 35 degree angle. Its cars have a capacity for 23 people and the cars travel at six miles per hour. The Monongahela incline operated for passengers primarily, but it also could carry freight provided the payload was small enough. But this was useful in some instances. For example, one A.W. Smith was said to have a greenhouse on Coal Hill, again, better known as Mount Washington today, and he grew lettuce in the greenhouse. Initially, he faced trouble with getting his product to market, what with the steep incline and all. But when the lift opened, his business boomed, thanks to the ease of access. The funicular made it such a success that he expanded his entire operation, founding the wholesale flower business of A.W. Smith Company, which boomed even greater once the dedicated freight incline opened alongside the existing in 1884. Since the Monongahela incline was such a runaway success, many others sought to replace it. One such funicular was the Mount Oliver incline, opened in 1872, serving Freiburg Street to Washington Avenue in the South Side Slopes. The third incline was Duquesne Incline, and this one was special. For one, it's unparalleled for sightseeing. It gives one of, if not the best view of downtown Pittsburgh and the point jutting into the water. It also has a unique track gauge standard being five feet long. The standard in the United States is three feet, and the only nations sharing this gauge are Finland, Russia, and Mongolia. Discussions on the Duquesne Incline began in August of 1875, culminating in the Duquesne Incline Plane Company formed to build the funicular opposite the New Point Bridge. It received a charter to build in January of the next year, and construction proceeded rapidly and with great public interest. The new funicular opened in May of 1877, constructed of wood and iron, but with the renovation to become completely iron in 1888. A similar story to the Monongahela Incline's steel structure renovation of 1882. Speaking of, the two inclines had a sort of friendly rivalry between them, being only about a mile apart. The two funiculars are generally credited for the development of the area, as the location surrounding them likely wouldn't have been paved so soon if not for their construction. Well, Duquesne fell on hard times in the 1960s, closing nearly permanently from 1962 to 1963, it and Monongahela flourished as tourist attractions in the 1970s. After being added to the Historic Places Register, the two funiculars served over a million commuters and tourists annually by 1977. Well, those good days have since passed, they are still treasures of Pittsburgh. However, you may be asking what happened to the other 15 funiculars? The Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon Plain was mentioned back during the origins of the Monongahela Incline, but what happened to it? Well, it was initially only a freight lift, 
serving exclusively coal as early as 1864, but after the success of the Monongahela Incline, it expanded to include passenger travel in 1874. However, this was not to last, as safety concerns forced it to close to passenger traffic, and so it lost out to other funiculars. It carried passengers only for emergencies up into the 1900s, and continued as a coal incline up until May the 1st, 1912, at which point it closed forever. Another incline mentioned was the Mount Oliver Incline, the second passenger incline in Pittsburgh, with a length of 1,600 feet and climbing 377 feet. It ran from Freiburg to South 12th Street and up Warrington Avenue. Designed in 1871 by John J. Enders, one of the mines behind the Monongahela Incline, it opened in 1872. However, it didn't enjoy the same success that its predecessor did, closing down altogether in 1951. The Monongahela Incline had a second freight funicular next to it, as was also mentioned earlier. With the same designers, this sibling of the Monongahela Incline was much larger, with a gauge of 10 feet. Opening in 1884, it could facilitate not only passengers and freight, but entire vehicles. It was imperative for the local economy, but as time wore on, its use lessened and closed altogether in 1935. The concrete pillars that supported the freight incline are still visible today. Now, for a funicular not previously mentioned, Samuel Desher wanted to build an incline to facilitate the transit of 20 tons of coal in one load. The design resulted in the Penn Incline, a freight funicular with a track gauge of 10 feet, traveling 840 feet in length and rising 330 feet. This funicular was enormous, with a bridge weighing in at over 750 tons, hanging over the Pennsylvania Railroad yards beneath it. An issue of the Street Railway Journal from 1891 claimed it to be the most heavily built plane in existence. It was as successful as it was heavy, consistently making a profit or at least breaking even when other funiculars needed to call in for grants to keep running. It was also enough of a frequent travel site that a small resort opened at the upper landing. That being said, at the end of World War II, the struggles began to outweigh the benefits. Forced to operate for only three hours in the morning and four in the afternoon, it was abandoned without opposition in 1953, remaining stagnant and eventually dismantled. Even so, its husk remains, and there have been discussions about reviving it as recently as 2020. This story is a common one. The funicular in question operates well enough during the 19th century, but as the turn of the century hits, hard times fall upon it, and eventually it closes. The only two exceptions to this are the Monongahela and Duquesne inclines, which remain to this day. So what's the culprit? Why have they all shut down? The answer is simple, automobiles. As the car became more widely available and private ownership became a common thing, there was no need to pay a fee to travel down a hill when you could just take a road and do the same thing. Sure, it was a more roundabout route, but it would take around the same time at the absolute worst, because generally speaking, the funiculars were not renowned for their speed. So as cars became more prominent, the funiculars failed. However, while the others have fallen away, the Monongahela and Duquesne inclines remain. Once rivals, these two have transcended the age of their heyday and survive into a new one, not as workhorses, but as treasures from another time. They are not only in the National Register of Historic Places, but are both recognized by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as historic mechanical engineering landmarks. Well, they aren't the same backbones of industry that they once were, they can rest easy now, secure in the knowledge that their prestige is among the greatest works in American history. And we'll leave it there for today, but special thanks to our channel members for sponsoring this episode. Click the join button to find out how you can become a member as well. And until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.